Hey, this is Craig. If you like this show and you want to support it and you want to keep it free, head on over to everyonelovesguitar.com forward slash support. That's everyonelovesguitar.com forward slash support. If you're a business owner and you want to increase your cash flow, or if you're a label or artist and you want to promote new music, then listen up. For information about advertising on Everyone Loves Guitar, including information on geographically targeted ads, go to everyonelovesguitar.com forward slash advertise. That's everyonelovesguitar.com forward slash advertise. If you want to buy or sell a home or investment property and you're here in the Tampa Bay area, in Hillsborough, Pinellas, or Pasco counties, then listen up. West Florida Real Estate is a local residential real estate broker that's helped over 250 Bay Area homeowners buy and sell their properties in the last four years alone. If you're looking to sell, you'll want to get their free report, The 7 Biggest Mistakes Homeowners Make When Hiring a Realtor. And if you're looking to buy a property, you definitely want to get your hands on The 21 Most Expensive Mistakes Tampa Home Buyers Make When Buying a Home. Each one of these reports is going to save you time and money. Inside, you'll discover the 7 Most Important Things to Consider When Hiring a Realtor, what to do if you're buying and selling a home at the same time, and the danger of choosing a realtor who agrees with everything you say. To get your hands on these free reports, head on over to WestFloridaRealEstate.com. That's WestFloridaRealEstate.com. Hey, everybody. This is Craig Garber. Welcome to Everyone Loves Guitar. Man, we got a really cool dude with us today. We're with the one and only Mark Muddy Dutton. And um, he's a very cool guy, and uh, you'll come to know him as Muddy Stardust. I just want to give Kevin Sepriano a big thank you for uh, hooking us up. Thanks, Kevin. So Mark Dutton's been playing music for 35 years. He started on trumpet, quickly moved to piano, began singing and playing bass and guitar in rock bands, and never looked back. He's since become a producer and songwriter. He's toured around the world many times, and he's either played with, produced, engineered, co-written, or toured with artists like Chris. Chris Robinson from the Black Crows in his band, the Chris Robinson Brotherhood. Great band if you've never checked them out. Mark Ford, Kathy Valentine, Dwight Yoakam, the Go-Go's, L.A. Guns, Gilby Clark, Jessica Simpson, the Brian Jonestown Massacre. And he's currently the bass player and vocalist for Chris Shiflett's band. Chris is from the Foo Fighters, of course. When he's not touring, Muddy and his partner, Audrey White, Right, I'm sorry, or Audrey Wright. Sorry, Audrey. And I say partner, and it's just his partner, not his partner like sexually. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. It might be his partner sexually, but like Nobody it's knows not anymore. his wife. You know, it's his <laughs> bu- actual business partner. God, how am I, deep shit am I getting myself into? Uh, they run, <laughs> they run Mod Entertainment, and they develop up and coming young artists, and they help guide them through you know the complicated music business and try to help them out and get them sorted and get them noticed. And they've both got a lot of experience in doing this. He's currently in pre pre-production of two shows made for tv he's got an after-school music program called mr muddy's music machine where kids in kindergarten to eighth grade learn and perform glee style versions of popular music past and present mark thanks so much for your time dude i appreciate you coming on the show thanks for having me you're welcome 8 a.m in la i am so fucking impressed let me tell you right now <laughs> <laughs> i used to say you stayed up. <laughs> you I haven't gone to bed yet. <laughs> I used to, yeah. Hey, how did you uh, first get started in the music business? Like, let's say your first adult gigs. Oh man, um, you know the the gig that stands out the most. I used to be in a martial arts when I was younger. Oh, cool. And um, my teacher, for some reason, found out that I was playing in a band, and uh, had us play at one of the you know the black belt ceremony things oh that's really and cool. i had this band with two girl singers and you know me on bass and 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 a drummer and we played for all these people and everybody was just kind of watching us scratching our head you know we played josie cotton songs and and all sorts of you know you know new wavy type stuff and that that's the gig that sticked out for me that was like wow this is really a weird thing but um as far as I don't know. You know, the, my first band was Burning Tree, really. You know, like I had solo right, bands man. in Orange County. My first band was Burning Tree with Mark Ford and uh, Donnie Costello. And um, that was our, you know, that was my real, my first foray into the, into the business. I told my parents, I was in, um, I was in college, actually, uh, at, uh, I think I was at like, 
I was either at UC Irvine or Cal State Fullerton at the time. And I just came home one day and I just said, mom, dad, I'm out. I got, I, I got to, I got to do music. I'm going to get signed. We're going to get signed and be famous. You know, like everybody said. Yeah. And sure enough, a few months later we got signed. So at that point, my parents stopped panicking a little bit and then it just kind of all moved forward from there. So they were, they were, they sound like they were supportive anyway, but they were just obviously concerned as a parent would be, but they were supportive. My parents were, you know, so supportive and, and, you know, they hated that I did that. And to be honest, that's one of my biggest regrets is not finishing school. And not only just for my own sake, but because they worked so hard to allow us to have the life we have. Sure. Um, I feel like it was a little disrespectful at this point. Um, but they were, you know, they were very involved. They were always at my gigs. They were always in the front row. Um, embarrassing me, you know, like with, with muddy <laughs> t-shirts on and, and <laughs> stuff like that, you know, and my dad, I actually flew my dad out to tour dates with uh, CRB with the Chris That's Robinson. That's awesome. Band. That's and a, they that was loved a great him. band. You know, everybody loved my dad. He was just, so cool, man. He was the fun guy, you know, he's just, he's, he was, he's a real working class Scotsman, you know, who just busted his butt and worked his way up. To what do you do? What'd your dad do? He was, he start he started out, you know, like a craftsman, you know, he did carpentry and, and, um, uh, he worked in it like an acid burning plant Holy in crap. Scotland where they just, you know, they ate asbestos sandwiches and, and acid all day. And then he, he came, when they came, when he came to America, he, um, he just figured it out. He became like the head of an engineering department at a, at a company called uh, Fuller Company. And, um, just did it you know and he was he was actually one of my musical inspirations he used to play sax and uh, clarinet and and a big giant accordion when he was a little kid that's how he made extra money for his for his family you know i i see memes like this in your story of your dad reminds you these memes like you know your dad's working in an acid plant when he's like 20 and now you see a 20 year old he's like on snapchat with bunny ears and it's like what the f it's unbelievable <laughs> isn't it i mean it, it's truly you know they talk about the greatest generation yeah. i have a hard time arguing you know, I know what i mean at this point you know? right now yeah it's a bit it's a bit yeah, yeah it was funny bit. like if all the instructions you know to how the world just got built got built to this point were gone yeah. We would be back to living in caves with a smartphone. Nobody knows how to do anything anymore. They just <laughs> watch videos of other people doing it. You know, very true. Yeah, man, it's very true. Very true, man. Um, that's really cool about your dad, man. Thank you for sharing that. Hey, and for if for whatever it's worth, as somebody who's, I think I mentioned to you before we started rolling that I have three kids. Your dad never. I know you said I would have. I felt I should have gone to school to because of the sacrifice he made as a dad. You just want your kid to be happy. Uh, he sh he probably had never given that a second thought. Because my kids yeah. have done so much that, like, at the time, I'm like, man, you know, you had a good up, and I don't give a shit now. Just as long as they're happy today, that's all it's yeah. about. Yeah. So, um, all right. How'd you get to also qualify Mark Ford? There's like a bunch of Mark Fords in music, like Robin Ford's brother. There, there's can you qualify the Mark Ford? I didn't know that. I, I, yeah, I Robin Ford's brother's Mark Ford. Um, Mark well, one Ford, of his brothers. Late, like after our band, uh, Burning Tree went for a little while. We were kind of the talk of the town for a minute in Los Angeles. And um, we made a record and we got to tour with the London Choir Boys. Um, Sharon Osbourne actually put us on that that tour. She was managing the Choir Boys. At the time. They were pretty big at, at, for like also they for a minute. Big. They were the English version of the Black Crows. We yes. had the Black Crows. You know, London had the London Choir Boys, and mm -hmm. we became really good friends with those guys. I still, I'm actually about to work on a on Spike's solo record, the singer. That's awesome, man. He's flying over here, um, hopefully, you know, in in a few in a few days, and we're going to do, do his uh, solo record. But um, Mark, uh, you know, we grew up in Cerritos with Donny, the drummer, and I was in Fullerton, and we kept bumping into each other. Um, at different Fullerton, gigs. as in that's in the home, wasn't that the home offender? Say again? Was in Fullerton the home offender? It was. Yeah, that's what I thought. It yeah. was. And you know, 
I, when I was a kid, when I was in uh, elementary school and junior high, I was right by the, the Fender factory. It was just a few blocks away from my school. People would dumpster dive, pull out whole Stratocasters and Telecasters because they put the label on wrong. Oh, you know? crap. And they would have this, this beautiful Telecaster. And then, of course, the smart guys would go in there and just start collecting parts and then right. sell them you know, at exorbitant rates to all, all the rest of us. But anyway, so we're talking about Mark Ford, who later joined the Black Crows. Right. Um, um, it's interesting. I don't know if you know this band. The modern day version of the Black Crows is another English band called the Temperance Movement. Do you know those guys? No, I don't. They're really good. It was funny because I listened to the guitar player. I listened, I interviewed the guitar player, Matt White, very cool guy. They're, these guys are all in their uh, early 40s, probably. And I listened to their band. I thought they were, a, for some reason, I thought they were like an alt band. But I'm listening to them. Like I said, hey, man, you guys sound like the Black Crows. In fact, you're, their lead singer is this like, Scottish guy. Just you know, talk about Scotland. Right. He's a Scottish guy, total Scotsman accent, but he sounds yeah. like he's from the South. I'm like, how the hell does he do that? He goes, I don't know. He goes, everybody Damn asks us. <laughs> It, but it's like, but they're like the modern day Black Crows. They sound just like, I mean, they're doing their thing, but the same exact genre of, you know, R&B. Uh, yeah. The ten, like check them out. Called temp the temperance, the movement. temperance Movement. Yeah, they're a really good band. And if you want to hook up with, if you want to talk to them, I can, I can I get you an introduction to Matt White. He's a super cool guy. Um, so talk about, how'd you get the name Muddy Stardust now? That's a very cool one. <laughs> so, when when Burning Tree first got together, you know we they we would we went over to England. We did a you know Black Crows tour and a, a London Choir Boys tour, um, and uh, we you know Mark is M A R C, I'm M R M A R K, and we would do interviews, <laughs> and they would constantly get you know our quotes wrong. Not that anybody gave a shit, yeah. you know what I mean? To us, it's like, oh, that's my idea or my opinion, you know, yeah. back in, in the day when your ego, you know, steered the, steered the ship. Yeah. But, um, yeah, so he, I was listening to Muddy Waters one day, and the next interview, he said, he told everybody, my name's Muddy. <laughs> <laughs> to, to, so to eliminate the mark. MD, and I was listening to Muddy Waters and then I, I started seeing these you know interviews in magazines you know those magazine things that they used to have and people read with paper yeah yeah um, yeah I've, I've seen that and, and, and it was it was that was it it just never went away and I was like alright so now you're Muddy so he did that to clarify then, then the second the second evolution of that <laughs> was I was in a band with Slim Jim Phantom mm -hmm. um, called Colonel Parker. And he, I, for some reason, well, you know, we did some covers. We played with Buddy Guy. We did a tour with Buddy Guy. And I think I did a, I did a cover of uh, Ziggy Stardust uh, where I sang, right? I just sang that one for, for whatever reason. And when it came time to credit, you know, to write all the credit for the record, I was MIA. God knows where I was or what I was doing, but they couldn't get a hold of me. So Slim Jim just credited me as, as Muddy Stardust, and then that was that. And that was it. The legend yeah. was born. That's yeah. so funny, man. I don't know if I could live up to a name like that. but you That's know. a very cool name, Muddy it Stardust. It it's like very, you need to have a, like a really involved story for that. <laughs> like, you know, I went on a pilgrimage to Turkey and I took some, Drug. Well, I was on a pilgrimage, I guess, I, I <laughs> but I certainly wasn't in Turkey. <laughs> what was your first big break that you got? Oh, man, it, a lot of breaks, you know, but I, get, I think besides Burning Tree, my first break, big break after that was L.A. Guns. And um, I... I walked in, there was a place called the Cat, the Cat Club on Sunset and Slim Jim Phantom owned it, right? Oh, okay. And uh, it was a place where everybody went and it just was the greatest, it had the greatest vibe and the greatest rock jams and everybody would hop up on stage and play a couple of songs and everybody was just happy the whole time, just, you know, big in music and being right there, you know? Right. 
So uh, I walked in for some reason with these two tall blonde girls on each arm. God bless you, man. Black fur. <laughs> I had a black fur coat thing. I looked like I was in Parliament or something, you know. <laughs> and I had this black, like furry leather long coat, and I was wearing these big platform boots and bell bottoms, you know. There you go. And right I walk in in the middle of jam, thinking I'm just, you know, you know, king of shit mountain, and um, sitting down as I walked in was Tracy Guns watching the jam. And he looked up at me, he's like, Muddy, how you doing? And I fringely knew Tracy, but not really well. They were kind of intimidating to me. You know, it's just like that whole um, 80s, you know, kind of hairband thing yeah. was just not my thing. I didn't get it, you yeah. know? But LA Guns actually kind of have a little bit of a weird punk rock kind of thing to them. Definitely. You know? but, but anyway, he just said, hey, you want to play bass in LA Guns? And I just, you know, I was probably three sheets to the wind. So I said, hell yeah. And then it, that started a four-year, you know, spinal tapish life <laughs> of touring, you know, with, with, with L.A. Guns. And it was fantastic. You know, Phil and Tracy are old school, you know, they're old school rock stars. And um, I don't know how, you know, people may argue like, yeah, you know, there was really Guns N' Roses or whatever. And maybe they weren't as big or whatever, but they were real, man. They, they, and he's still doing it. They're he's still, still doing it. it. Yeah, really hardcore yeah. now. He's out yeah. touring. and. Uh, yeah, but that was like, I'm always grateful for that. That's and cool. Tracy, Does Tracy he know? was very cool to me. Tracy, you know, I, I'm not sure how it ended. It always ends a little rough with things, you know, but I think I quit for, for, just because there wasn't enough money to, to, to be able to go out. But I always remember Tracy telling me one thing that, you know, it, that has stuck with me forever i was frustrated one day and he said muddy the one thing you have to remember the strongest word in the english language is no say no sometimes don't be afraid to say no once you're not afraid to say no it becomes much more clearer when you should say yes and when you should say no and i never forgot that Words of wisdom from, um, you know. Are you good about saying no now? Yeah, you have to say, you, you know, saying no in a, in a, in a thoughtful, you know, forward thinking way in, in order to get to the place you want to get to. You can't be afraid. Like I've, I'm a, I'm a people pleaser. Like I hate, I hate it if, if, if people don't, you know, like me or respect me, you know, and I, and as I get older, I, I care less and less, you know, but you. I, but it interfered with my, you know, with my forward movement in my career, you know, and in my personal development, you can't do that. You have to be, you have to be open to criticism and open to your shortcomings, yeah. you know, but in this business, it's so hard to do that. You just have to be, you know, super confident about everything you do. Um, or people will, you know, the vultures will come in and start picking your bones. You know, that's a very, very common issue for a lot of people of, you know, I like, you know, it's important to me to be liked and I have a hard time saying no. But as you said, the problem is when you don't set up those healthy boundaries, then you wind up resenting not only the other person, but yourself, because fuck, why didn't I say no? So that's a lot of people I think um, that I've spoken, you know, at least probably half the, half of the people are, you know, struggle with that and are, or that's their issue, you know? Of, of, I did, a, I did in my early producing career, I did a Humper's record for, for like $99. <laughs> yeah. You should have but definitely said no to that. Super fun. It was a drunk tank, I think was, was the single. <laughs> he ended tank. up. They actually ended up getting signed. I think years later on uh, Epitaph. Uh, wow. Mm. All right. So I'm going to name some artists you've worked with. Talk about how you got the gig, and a cool or interesting story about working with them. Let's start with uh, Chris Robinson and the, and the Chris Robinson Brotherhood. What a great band! I, I told you I saw them like five years ago down here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, he. You know, we had, we had become, we had all become friends, you know, on the first tour. We toured with them on their first record. And um, 
then Burning Tree broke up and Mark joined the band. And then I hadn't talked to Mark in a while after that. Every once in a while, we'd talk on the phone. Um, and then years went by and I was working in my backyard doing something. And the phone rang and uh, he, the guy said, hey, Muddy, what's going on? It's Chris. And I'm like, Chris, you know, Chris who? <laughs> Chris, Chris Robinson. Uh. And I'm, um, you know, was, you know, I was, I'm like, what? Oh, cool. What's going on? Dude? How are you? He's like, listen, man, I hate to do this to you, but can I borrow five thousand bucks? And I was like, I was stunned, you know. So I kind of paused for a second, and I'm like, uh, okay, I guess, sure. He says, no, I'm just fucking with you. I'm putting a band together. I need a bass player. <laughs> And that was it. That you know, was and, it. And then I did that for about five years. Wow. That's a funny, uh, <laughs> that's a funny. He's a, Chris is, I don't know if people know this about Chris, but he is one of the funniest people I have ever met in my life. <laughs> and that includes cool. professional funny people. He is so, he's really well read. He's a super well read person. And, you know, he devours books. He'll go through a stack of books on a, on a tour, you know? And um, he, he's probably one of the most naturally talented singers I've ever come across. Uh, he's honest. a super great, he's an amazing writer, man. He writes some great, writer, great freaking songs. Great writer, great, just, just absolutely natural singer, you know? Him and Dwight Yoakam, I think, for me, are the two greatest singers i've ever had the pleasure of working with when did you work with Dw how long did you work with dwight oh i only played four or five gigs with dwight was this when pete um, was in the band pete anderson or was that when that was, it's always a, it's always a funny story with me i it's like <laughs> he, i i was um i got a phone call he had us, uh like a little while at marine i think i was either kid eager mitt to call me the buddy you think you could do a Dwight Yoakam gig? And I'm, you know, I said, sure. I, you know, whatever. I can play whatever you want me to play. And, and he, they said, well, it's in, it's in like two days, you know, at the, <laughs> in, in uh, Los Angeles. And I said, oh, fuck. okay, well just, you know, send me the set and let me, let me work chat a little bit. So their management sends me a stack of CDs like this big, like his, like his whole career <laughs> of CDs. And they want, and I, I just call back, say, I can't do this. Just give me the song that you're doing currently. That was 30 songs. Holy crap. So, so I did it, man. I just busted my ass. I locked myself in a room. I learned it all as, as best as I could. You know, the high harmonies, the three-part harmonies on everything. It was top. That was one that's of the crazy, hardest, man. most 30 songs in two days. That's, yeah. that's, that's nuts, man. So, really so nice. co come gig night, I am probably more nervous than I've ever been. Right. So I'm, I'm, so I'm on stage waiting for the curtain. I think there was a curtain. But we're waiting for Dwight to walk on stage. I've never met him. I've never even talked to him. At this point, ladies and gentlemen, Dwight Yoakam. So he walks. <laughs> you never me. met him. He walks past me. He looks at me. He's like, "Nice to meet you, buddy, Dwight Yoakam." <laughs> like Elvis. Seriously, it was like meeting Elvis. He walked up to the mic, killed it, killed it, right? And then he invited me in the bus afterwards. I thought, "Oh shit, here we go." <laughs> you drop that note, you know. I know. And he just said, hey, thank you, buddy. You know, that was, that was really fun. And then his management started calling me for, um, for different gigs. Oh, that's great. You know? And then, and then I, we did, we did, he's, he's, the, he's the guy, that was also one of the most uncomfortable things I've ever done. He, we were about, we were doing a sound check for the first of a few gigs. And he looked over at me and said, oh, buddy, I want you to play uh, upright on this. And the, the, the tour manager is telling Dwight, it's like, no, we told you, Dwight, Muddy doesn't play upright. He only plays electric. So he, 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 he,
you know, he's, he's frustrated. And then he turns around and he looks at me. He's like, it's, it's, it's got four goddamn strings on it. What the hell is the difference? <laughs> so he makes the, the manager bring me upright up on stage. And, and he says, buddy, you want to try this? I said, sure, I'll give it a try. I, and, and so I played like five or six songs on upright. I had never played an upright in my life. Oh, that was so I, really? I put little pieces of tape on the back, you know, so I knew where, where, where the, the frets were. were. Good for you. And that was it. And that's how I started playing upright. Did, um, who is guitar? Who is his, was it Pete Anderson at that no, time? No, it wasn't Pete. It was Keith Gaddis. Keith uh, Gaddis was the first guitar player. And then, um. So this is way back. Uh, this was back. Yeah, yeah. This yeah. was, this was years ago. And then, uh, uh Brian, Whel uh, then I did a couple gigs. With Brian Whelan. He's a great, he's a really nice guy. I love Brian. Yeah. yeah he's, I interviewed he's him. Brian he's a and really I played with Chris guy. Schiffler. Yeah, he's a really sweet guy. Okay, so wait a minute. No, this is after Pete Anderson then. This was before they got Eugene Edwards. Yeah, there's two. There were two camps. Yeah. You know, the Anderson camp and the Dwight Yoakam camp. And I guess the two that Sean Fleet. Yeah. Well, Pete is a great guitar player, man. He, he produced all yeah. of Dwight's early stuff. Yeah. yeah. That was really, that was really uh, great production. That was really original production for back then, he, especially he, for country. Yeah. You know? He's, he's a really smart blast. guy. Really smart guy. Uh, Gilby Clark. Gilby, you know, honestly, I can't remember how I started playing with Gilby. Um, but it was mostly me, Gilby, and Chad. Chad Stewart, who plays in uh, Faster Pussycat now. Um, and we, it was just a three-piece thing. I really liked the idea of doing a three-piece. So, um, we did, God, we did a lot of touring, him and I. Um, and it was, I just, under, it was just under his name, Gilby Clark? It was under Gilby Clark, and that was after L. LA Guns. Right. That's probably how he kind of connected with me. Cat yeah. Club and, and uh, right. L.A. Guns. Any funny rock and roll stories from that? Oh, God, so many. <laughs> I figured. <laughs> I, I got to do that after, you know, after, after everyone's dead. <laughs> Pretty, pretty good stuff, though. Yeah, pretty after fun. everyone's dead. Yeah. Uh, Kathy Valentine and the Go Go's. I I I've played gigs with Kathy, um, and I produced her first record, her oh, first cool. record. Um, and I got to work, <laughs> I got to work with the Go Go's. I was working for a company uh, uh, under a guy named uh, Kerry Brown, and we were doing movie music and television music and, and whatever, you know. Um, but we would also record people every once in a while. They would just come up, you know. Um, his wife is Stacy Shear, you know, who did, uh, who's a producer. She's a music, m movie producer who, you know, whose roster is just incredible. Pulp mm. Fiction, Gattaca, oh, wow. Fisher King. Holy you know, smokes. Great stuff. Just really good stuff. But anyway, um, so we got to work with, you know, uh, Billy Corgan, Courtney Love, um, Jessica Simpson. And we got to do, every once in a while they'd come up and they'd, they'd need a song done for whatever reason, you know. And um, the, the Go-Go's came up because I think they were doing, I think they were thinking about some kind of a show that they wanted to do. So they came up and did a song for that. And uh, I got to work with the Go-Go's. I had known Kathy already. Yeah. But um, that was really funny because they just came up one at a time. I think they were fighting at the time. Oh, my God. Like, like so a lot of bands, you know. I, I, but but um, they didn't really want to hang out with each other, I guess. So, you know, uh, I did drums one day, and then Kathy came in. We did bass. You know, then, then uh, uh, Belinda came in. You know, we did vocals. It was funny. And then, of course, there was a telephone game. You know, hey, can you turn up the drums or... You turn up the bass or the bar or whatever. Oh God. That was that was actually kind of funny. They were really fun to work with though. They were they were pretty funny. That's cool. So you're like therapist slash producer slash uh you know uh, art um uh, mostly and, therapist. Mostly therapist, <laughs> yeah. I hear you, man. Yeah. And then you're currently working with Chris Shiflett. How'd you guys connect? Yeah, we just he just switched bands. He went with um uh that went really well. That was fun. We did about we did 
two different years of touring with them uh, in between Foo Fighters gigs. And um, he's, uh, he's got, I think, schedules and, um, you know, uh, availability and stuff kind of made it so he just wanted to start over with a new group of sure. people. So he's doing that now. But that was good. That was fun. He was fun to work, work with. And um, we had some good times. What would you say, if you can, what's the top three musical experiences that you've had? Because you've done a lot for a long time. <sighs> Brian Jones Sound Massacre. Interesting. It's probably easily my most valuable experience on different levels. Um, doing those records, I did two records with, with them. Um, Give It Back. That we recorded in seven days at Peer at Peer Publishing. Seven days. That's yeah. That was awesome. that was pretty rough. Um, they split on tour like on the eighth day, and I finished mixing and overdubbing and all, all that stuff. Like I I read a little bit about they split a lot. There's a lot of stress in that band, from what I understand. <laughs> Is I putting it mildly? Am I being like really politically correct? <laughs> yeah. Um, Anton is a very um, first of all, he's one of the purest artists I've ever, ever worked with by far. That guy, it's painful for him not to be making art, hmm. you know, in, in exactly the way that he wants to make it, you know, it's physically painful for the night. So, um, and he's really the only guy I've met that, you know, flips the industry, the bird and means it. <laughs> it's not for show he doesn't yeah. care you know he just cares about doing music i've learned when someone says that so and so is a pure artist and, um, that was, uh, drug stuff druggy stuff and and um a lot of tensions not a lot of money yeah and, and a lot of work but it's i truly became a producer on that second record that was one of the hardest things um, and and greatest things I think. In the first record was "Give It Back" that you did. And the yeah. second one was "Give It Back." Was at I I came on board at the end of a string of producers that got fired. Wow! Because <laughs> they didn't want to do it. it was Not just, too much pressure. It's really, difficult. it's really hard. If you watch that movie, Dig, it's kind of it's that. Okay. There's nothing pretend about that documentary. Um, I think there's a book now too. Actually. Uh. But um, I came in at the end of that, so it wasn't that hard. And there's a lot of stories about Anton, you know, freaking out on, on people. And for whatever reason, Anton always showed me a lot of respect. And I, I showed him respect back. And um, on the second record, I mean, I think he fired me six or seven times on the second record. And then I just got used to getting up in the morning and drinking coffee near the studio because I knew I was going to get a call. Where are you? You know, get in here. We got to finish this. So, wow. um, yeah, that was that was crazy. But I really did like the guy, and I and I, I really liked the fact that he gave me that chance. He put my name on the cover of the record. Uh, oh, as part man. Of the record. that's you know, and nobody. I don't cool. know if he ever did that before. You know, it's just, it just it was that really meant a lot to me, and it really made me want to work really hard for the guy and root for him. What was the second record you did? What was that name? The um, record. Strung Out in Heaven. Great name. Yeah. Yeah, he was great. He was he was the mastermind of all of that stuff. But he made me realize that being a producer isn't controlling everything. Sometimes it's allowing the chaos to happen to the point where it's not productive anymore. And then you have to step in and, you know, draw lines. Second, number two, top three experiences. Wow. Um, man, that's hard. I would have to say just ex musical experiences. I would have to say, you know, my first touring with Burning Tree. You know, we got to go out with the Choir Boys and the Black Crows and uh, Dogs de Moor. And um, I think we went out with the Four Horsemen two at one point because we were young and we thought we knew everything and then you know realize you, later you realize you don't know anything 
but it was, yeah, that it was works, fantastic. It? we got to see the world and and um and figure out you know and and you know we got to realize what that life is you know that's a tough life just touring all the time and never being home i don't it's really like really tough i don't know how you know obviously i've, I've talked to almost 600 musicians um yeah, it's really tough. I don't know how you guys, it's not something I would have wanted to do. It's a tough, it's a, and I respect so much the commitment that you guys all make to either your art or to your instrument or to just playing to sack. Cause it's a huge sacrifice, man. You know, a guy gets on a plane, you know, he lives in California, gets on a plane and, and to fly to New York to do a gig one night. And then he goes to Germany for two nights and then flies back to California. That's really difficult, man. That's yeah. not easy at all. You know, it's like it's time not, travel. It's not. I mean, when you're, for me, you know, when you're young and, yeah. and you're still looking for things, you're still looking for, you know, whatever, what you think is going to fill that hole. Yeah. Um, it's great because you wake up in a new place and it's a new opportunity. Right. For something new to happen, you know? Sure. But I... For me, I don't like to go on long tours anymore just because I love my wife and I like being home. Yeah, I feel really like that, I really like producing and working, you know, trying to, you know, trying to work on something of, of substance, you know, in a world of um, ones and zeros. <laughs> that was very, now you were very politically correct. Um, <laughs> what would be number three, third most, the third best experience? Um, Brian Jones Town Massacre, touring with Burning Tree. Uh, I would say, man, I don't know. You know, there's so there's so many of them. Uh, I like to, you know, I I I make video videos now too. I make music videos, so doing writing and directing, uh, co-directing my first uh, music videos was pretty great. What, what, what was the, what were some of those videos? Um, Blue Stroud is one of them. Um, uh, a song called Blue Town. And uh, a band called Bo, B-E-A-U-X-X, and with a song called Thing One. Cool, man. Yeah, you've done so much stuff. You said you're originally from Fullerton? Yeah. What was, what was your childhood like growing up? Um, you know, it was pretty nice, you know, it was pretty beautiful. I doubt it, it, it was just felt like a smaller town back then. And, um, it was pretty great. And then as I became, uh, as I became a teenager, uh, you know, the, we had all the bands like, uh, adolescence, social distortion, um, agent orange, we had all the punk rock bands, you know, we would, uh, we would be. We sh I think we shared a space with Mike Ness, a little rehearsal space at one point. And um, it was pretty great. There was a, you know, there was a little freaky scene, hmm. a little art scene of music. And it was pretty cool for a little while. That's awesome. Do you have any brothers or sisters? I have two sisters. Any of them play music? Yes. Uh, my sister, Leanna, plays music. They have a band called Honey Slide. And they do Gaelic-y, um, folky kind of based stuff. That's that's very cool. It's very atmospheric. Man, there's so much different music out there, man. I hear like that's the one thing I was not expecting. I've been turned on to so much cool music. And what I my standards for music have changed because I think I understand how tough it is to make music and so i will hear a record that i may not otherwise have enjoyed oh. or i wouldn't put it on my repeat list but i know when i when when the the guitarist plays the riff and it's just amazing and i'm like man i know how much that took and i appreciate it so much more it's really weird i don't i don't know why but um i i i, I totally hear you i mean i listen to a lot of stuff now just because i work i work with you know, pop girls and, and I work with a bunch of different kind of people. And uh, you're right. When you do something and you realize the, the time and effort that went into it, 
it's a lot harder to criticize it. Yeah. It's like a movie. You know, when you, when you work in the movie industry too, it's, you, you just, you realize, you know, I'm not going to say that that was a piece of shit movie anymore. I'm going to say, well, maybe, you not know, my thing, but they cut you know. corners on the script or the casting or whatever it is, but it's the same with music. You know, yeah. it's really hard to judge. The problem I have now though, is you don't know what you're listening to. You don't know what happened in post with music now. Oh Back yeah. In the day when you're listening yeah. to the record, you know, that shit, there's no hiding that. Yeah. That's what it is. It be, it was a thing, you know, and Zeppelin, you know, another great example of just yeah. of just an incredible yeah. time in creativity and an incredible time in dedication to your craft. Yeah. You know, you didn't get to be a singer in the seventies unless you could sing. Right. There's no pitch correct. There's no, there's no patience for that. No one would even consider letting you do it. it right. Anymore. It would be like in a pro it, it would, and it wouldn't even feel right if they it did wouldn't feel right. It would be ridiculous. Nobody yeah. would let it happen. Right. I am guilty. I'm, I'm as guilty as the next guy of, you know, repairing and patching and fixing and masking and doing whatever I do with Pro Tools. You know, like I play drums on most of the stuff that I record now. Hmm. Um, I'm a great drummer with Pro Tools. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm an okay drummer outside of that. Yeah. But as far as you couldn't take the time to write for the song, to service the song yeah. the way that you can now, it would cost $100,000 back then. Right, more, I totally get it. You know, I think our first record cost like three hundred grand or something. You know, what I mean, burning it's okay. tree. Yeah, it's okay. It's pretty good, but wow. you know, it's not. It ain't Exile on Main Street. Yeah, it's not know? Led Zeppelin one. I get it. No, yeah. It's not. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but so I just I struggle a lot with that. I struggle with the the. Uh, you know, we live in a world of things pretending to be other things, right? You know, and, it, and it's like- I understand well, exactly what you're saying. Yeah, and it's, it's a, it, it has a, there's a, it has a huge effect on our humanity as artists and musicians and, and painters. It, it really does. But the mo there was one Mona Lisa. Is that the greatest painting you've ever seen? No. No. It's great. It's amazing, but it has an energy to it because there's only one. Well, I think the problem is because I'm into photography, right? I love photography and I look at all these pictures and this won an award, that won an award. And I immediately see all the post-production yep. and I'm totally turned off because the problem is the, the, the skill set that people now work on isn't, man, let me get the right light here it's oh i gotta work on my post-production skills because i can make it look great yeah. and so when i see photographs that i i totally am turned off because i look at it i'm like it's not real it's like the the colors are is, is shimmering in the the sky the stark contrast i'm like man this is post-production i mean i don't it just I'm not. Which is, which is an art, though, right? But but it's it's painting by numbers now. I don't feel that in here when I look at that, though. I feel like disappointment. I feel. I think I vacillate back and forth between disappointment, and just feeling like an old man screaming at kids to get off his lawn. <laughs> it, it's like, look, here's the thing, art, like everything else, you know, in the universe is evolving right okay language in my opinion is devolving you know with text oh and god yeah but you, but you know they stop here in I, I i don't i think this is true my wife was telling me they no longer teach writing like like the like writing how to write cursive and stuff like that they know they stopped teaching that they down here in schools yeah. yeah mostly I mean, and i'm true. like Cause, and you know why? Because you don't need to learn how to write your, you are, yeah. you know, so funny. You know, I mean, it's, it's... Apparently, you don't even need to know how to spell because I'll, you know, I'll be reading a newspaper or, and, and there's, there's, there are grammar errors in the title. You know, I mean, come on, people. Seriously, just run it by, run it by somebody over 40. 
right <laughs> before you publish you know how hard is that i know i know i like it you're I right though because you I, I think, you don't yeah, yeah. pro yeah. tools I, I love it you know i use it every day um it can be a tool or it can be a weapon you know I, I, and and it just you know it's changing what art is let's not say that you're a painter if you're not going to just get pull out an easel and paint yeah and, you're, if, you know, if you're just doing a digital thing and you're changing, you're not really a painter, are you? Right. And that's okay. It's okay. But, but don't, don't say, say yeah. you, don't say you're a photographer if you have 10 million, uh, you know, pictures on a, on a drive. You know, a monkey can do that. Right. Give a monkey a camera. I, I promise you they will take some great pictures. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, and, and that's, that's, we have to be aware of that. I'm not saying don't do it. I'm not saying, oh, this is better than that. But I'm saying we have to be honest with each other. We have to yeah. be honest about what is humanity and what isn't humanity. No, and I agree. A lot of bad things about humanity. Uh, but there's also a lot of amazing, incredible things about humanity. Let's not pretend that we're doing something we're not here. You know? Yeah, right. I agree with you. Right. It's like I'm looking at your landscape and everything it's such a beautiful picture but i'm sitting here thinking i would guarantee in our lifetimes it's going to get to the point where you could push a button and i'll see a totally different maybe i'll see you on the beach in hawaii mm -hmm. or you know at uh, in bryant park in midtown manhattan yeah and so uh is that cool i don't know is it some of it is but you know it's just weird and maybe I don't think it is. I, I, honestly, I don't think it is cool. I, I, you know, this three-dimensional existence is enough for me for many, many, many lifetimes. <laughs> you know? And it just, it just feels like we're, you know, exponentially accelerating the process now. Yeah. And, and, you know, technology, it is, it can be great. It truly can. Um, but you kind of have to slow down a little bit. Like, do we really need this? Do we yeah. need 5G? Seriously? I mean, like, we're talking, you know, thousands of miles apart. We're talking right now. Right. How much more do we need? How much easier do we have to make it on? You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, how I much easier? That. Like, pick up a rock, you know, move it from one place to another. Yeah. Just Try it. See what happens. You know? No, I, I get you, man. It's it's a tough balance. It really yeah. is. And 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 I think some of it is because, is because we're older. I think like my kids don't question this stuff because this is what they grow up with. You know. Yeah. Thank God, I'm able to question it. Yeah. You know, I, I it must be hard. You know, you, they, they they were born into this. Yes. Now they were born into this. You know, like looking down at this screen. It's like look at all my friends. Those aren't for your friends. You know. Bingo. Those are heroes you know yeah. wow look at what i did well you didn't really do that that's snapchat you know right. it's just like somebody else did it some some software programmer guy yeah. you know who probably got paid nothing actually did that <laughs> hey let me ask you this um any low points that you went through in life and, and how'd you get through them dark periods um yeah my divorce i was married before one time not something i'm proud of um and I, uh, you know, it was mostly my fault. I look back, you know, we're good. For, her, her and I are good friends still. We went through some really rough patches after the divorce. Um, but we're still, we're still very close. She's still my family. That's good. And that was, I think that was a part where I started. I think that's where I started to grow up a little bit. After you know, that. Um, you know, a decent functioning adult you know um my parents uh passing very difficult they're still with me they're with me right now they're telling me not to cuss <laughs> well it's good that they are because i won't ever tell you that <laughs> i'm trying to watch my language you know <laughs> um yeah i mean there's you know there's a lot I'm just, I'm more aware now. I used to, I used to, you know, drink and, and, uh, have a lot more, uh, ex, you know, uh, fun than I do now. And, um, are you sober? Are you guys, are you someone who's gotten sober? Uh, right now I'm sober. I've been sober for about five years, I think. Awesome, man. Um, 
Congratulations. I just woke up one morning. I was so tired. <laughs> I, I can't do this anymore. I'm too tired, you know? And I just got a lot more done. I just, I, I'm probably, well, maybe some people would disagree with this, but I'm probably easier to get along with now. You gotta be if you're so if if you were like an alcoholic and you're sober now, like any addict, whatever the addiction is, man, it, you've got to be an easier person to deal with. I think I was just a really insecure person, and I still am. You know, I um, I still think any day now someone's gonna figure out how, how I'm faking it. You know, <laughs> um, but but you don't need alcohol to cope with that now. No, I don't. Right. Uh, you know, speaking of, I can't remember. I remember one funny story from Burning Tree. Um, we were at the Coconut Teaser. It's a great club that gave us our break. A guy named Len Fagan ran this place. And that's actually how I met my first wife, Nina. Um, uh, we were about to go on stage. And, you know, chemicals were not available for us. Right. And we realized... We had never played a sober gig. Wow. The whole time we were banned, ever. Even <laughs> rehearsals, you know. I would show wow. up with a bottle of vodka. Donnie would show up with a bottle of Jim. And Mark would show up with a bottle of Jack. And we'd rehearse till they were gone, pretty much, you know. Shit, ridiculous. It was yeah, ridiculous, was right? Terrible. So, but we went on and played. And we were terrified. It, we thought it was the worst gig we ever played. And people still tell me that was the greatest gig you guys ever played. It's the best you guys ever sounded. Yeah. So. Imagine that. Yeah. Yeah. Good for you, man. Well, I'm glad you're sober, man. I'm glad you're feeling good. Mm. Any advice you'd go back and give to uh, younger Mark, if you were open-minded to listen, what would you have said? You're not as, as important as you think you are, you know, just chill out and just try to, I wasn't, I was so set in my ways and worried about the future that I was not, I, I lost my focus on what I was doing at the time. And you can't do that. It is a recipe for failure. You just have to, you know, be open organically to what's going on to the people you trust, take advice, figure out when to take the advice and when to say, no, I'm doing it my way. There and you this, go. Back to saying learn no. your lessons, yeah. you know, and, and then lick your wounds. But, um, I would say, you know, to young people, music is important. It's important. Okay. Art is important and it's not about making it easier. Okay. It's not about the, the, the thing I like about pro tools is it makes it cheaper you gotcha. know, it makes it so that you can, you know, everybody's a producer now you know, right. every kid with a computer and, and, you know, uh, is a producer and a musician and like, Oh, check the, check out this song that I wrote and produced and played. It's just like, well, okay. I guess. I get it. You know, I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's painting by numbers. It's, it's throwing loops together, you know, like check out this beat I, I, I wrote, you know, it's like, you didn't write that. You know, you yeah. Just, you put it together. You grabbed a bunch of things and that's okay. I'm not saying sure. there isn't value to that, but it's very dangerous when you start telling yourself that you are smarter than you really are. You know, I have come to realize that my ripe, old age that i am an idiot <laughs> well yeah you know what man i think in general um i have this expression smart people realize how little they know and stupid people think they know everything that's yeah, been my I observation used to think i know everything I, I, you know? And, and um i jump in always trying i'm always trying to fix things you know my ex used to call me the fixer that's why you can't say no man I can't say no. It's a codependency. I I always it's all think codependent that, stuff, man. Yeah, it's codependency. It, it, yeah. it truly is, you know, without getting into a psychobabble. But it, you know, you, there's an effect for everything you do. My yeah. instinct is to catch somebody right. you know, and help them. And, and, but there's, there is a butterfly effect for everything we do. 100%. How little Consequence. it is. And sometimes being unliked and saying no is the greatest thing you can do for someone and yourself. 
for yourself yeah. more importantly. Yeah, man, for sure. Hey, um, let's talk about back to playing for a minute. Who's some of the favorite guitar players you've enjoyed jamming with? Man. Yeah. It's wow. How do we save the guitar? Right. At this point, <laughs> I think it's coming guitar? back, man. I think it's coming back. It back you know, um, the favorite guitar players that I played with or yeah, that you've, that you've enjoyed jamming with. Yeah. In general. Yeah, no, either one. You can talk about either one or whatever you like. Talk about guys you've played with, actually. Uh-oh. Are we frozen? Sort of. I hear you, but I can't see you. <laughs> We're halfway frozen. There you go. Yeah, there we go. Um, okay, so favorite guitar players that I've played with? or Yeah, played with. Well, playing with Bob Weir was pretty great. Holy shit. When did you do that? He got to, he would come up and jam sometimes uh, uh, with, with, uh, with CRB. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And when Phil came up, wow. of course I was out of a job. So he would just come up and play through my rig and I got to, I would sneak into the audience, you know, and stand in the back and watch. And that was freaking amazing. Watching this is like, what? This is so weird. You know, people would look over at me like, wait a second. Aren't you? No, I'm not. Watch the show. Wow. <laughs> so Phil Lesh and Bob Weir would come up. Yeah. Yeah. And that was really, that was really fantastic. But I have to say one of the most old school fluid guitar players was Mark. Yeah. Um, he, like Neil Young, Mark Ford could play a single note and it would sound like no other guitar player. That is a guitar player. Yeah, man. hundred percent. Diddly, diddly, diddly stuff. Now, in that category, Tracy Guns. Yeah. Is unbeatable. Right. He truly is. Like, I didn't even get it. You know, after he asked me to join LA Guns, they were playing at a, at a show in LA. And I, and I thought, fuck, I better go see this band. You know, <laughs> what the hell is this all about? So I'm watching the band. And I got to be honest, they were freaking amazing. Yeah, he's a, he's a great player. Great. He's such a great guitar player. Yeah. He does have a lot of Jimmy Page in him. Yeah. You know, and it's not, musically, it's slightly different. It's an updated version. But he's got that in him, and, yeah. and, and he really, truly believes in what he does. So those two guys, um, you know, Neil, Neil Casal's a great guitar player. Completely oh, God, yeah. Completely different kind of guitar player. He's, he's not wonderful, a, man. He's a, he's a texture guy. You know, I, I think of him more of, more of a, uh, you know, like a Radiohead type uh, approach. He's, he's, a, he's one of my favorite players, man. He's got such good tone, that guy. ghetto bird what's the matter there's a ghetto bird flying overhead our airplane we get a we get a, a fire copter that goes that we're like right under the route of some fire helicopter thing or something i, don't I know. couldn't even hear it it's weird huh. who else <clears throat> brian whelan's a great guitar player he is he is he really is um He's a very tasteful guitar player. I um I had him play on on a session for me one time. And uh he he just played rhythm really. You know, and then we had like I, I wanted him to come back and fix some things and we had a falling out over that for some reason. I d I don't some stupid misunderstanding. We're, Have you guys patched it up? We patched it up, yeah. Oh, good. Yeah, he's, he's, he's such a humble guy. He was a really nice person. He is a person. humble guy. He just, he said something that just rubbed me the wrong way. And then I said something back and whatever, just kind of hurt my feelings or something. Yeah. Whatever. But then I went back to listen. I actually play a lot of guitar on that song. And I couldn't get one part of it right. And I unmuted what he did in the original, on the original session. And that was it. It sounded good, yeah. Right. He had yeah. this old Ron Wood feel like Pete Richard Z kind of feel and it just like that was the one I ended up using. I, I really enjoyed talking to him. He's a very genuine guy, man. Yeah, he's super funny too. Yeah. I like funny people that make me laugh. <laughs> you know, Chris is good. You, some of these people you wouldn't think so. Brian's so quiet. You would yeah, he is pretty quiet. I was surprised to hear you say he was funny. He was very not very sweet, very not very love lovely guy. He, yeah. he was pretty quiet. He wasn't he's like a dark sarcastic that's Something funny. That I find funny. very amusing. That's good, man. Yeah. yeah. What's the first record you ever bought? 
Do you remember that? Yeah, I sure do. Black Market Clash. Wow. Hell yeah. It was the first, you know, I was, I was behind on all that stuff because my parents wouldn't let me go to concerts. Um, I was a dork. I didn't talk to girls. I didn't know. You know, I, I had no idea about anything. I was just. Uh, That's unusual when you have two sisters. Usually the, the guys with the sisters are like the ladies, the magnets. I was, yeah, I was not a ladies man. You know, I don't think I've ever been a ladies man, really. Um, but I wanted to be. You know, once I started playing music, like, wait a second, girls are talking to me now. Yeah, yeah, I, I like this. But I met a guy named Al Oliver, and he has no idea what an influence he was on me. Um, I bring him up any possible time I can. That's he cool. is the guy that got me into television, Tom Verlaine, hmm. The Velvet Underground, uh, Parliament. <laughs> uh, everything at the time that mattered. He drew up, dragged me into it, kicking and screaming. He would come to my house, knock on the door with a record in his hand. He, he'd go to my record player, he'd put it on there and he'd make me listen to it. And I didn't get it like, this sucks, but it didn't suck. And later on, I realized that it didn't suck. That's um, cool. And, man. and it, was, it was something that he, uh, it, he changed my life that way. He really Are you buddies did. with him on Facebook at least? Uh, I'm sorry. Say that again. Are you buddies with him on Facebook? No, we? we talk on the phone still. Oh, okay. Oh, so you're friends yeah, with him. So, okay. That kind of stuff. Yeah, He's yeah. a crazy guy. He's a weirdo. Yeah. yeah. Um, but that was a huge influence on me. Top desert Island discs. Knee jerk reaction. Top three. Man, knee jerk would have to be Pink Floyd, Led Zeppelin. Um, which, which Floyd album? You know, dark side, yeah, that kind of stuff. Um, I would have to say, uh, in through the outdoor. Interesting. Maybe. Okay. Um, and um, man, the third one's always the hardest because it, you know, <laughs> I, you know, the Beatles, the Stones, um, the Who, um, the Cocteau Twins. There's all sorts of weird stuff. Yeah, Bowie. That is Bowie, Neil Young, Dylan. Gotcha, man. Um, You're a child of the. I'm so sexist. I didn't. I didn't. Did I name any women in that? Yeah, Cocteau Twins. Uh, oh, dude, you're done. You've got way too many now at this point. You, you had <laughs> over your quota. <laughs> Billy Holiday. There you go. There That's you go. All righty. Most important things you've learned about yourself throughout your life? Um, you know, I, did, I think I said it earlier that, you know, I'm an idiot. You know, I just have to, uh, you know, whenever I start doing something, you know, I, I, I'm trying, I'm conscious about like, do it in an organic, open-minded way. And then when I, when I start finishing it, I hate it, you know, and I want to do something else. And, and I think a lot of that is ego, you know, and like we were talking about earlier, like worrying about what other people think, but. Well, you know, there are people, some people are really good starters and not good finishers. I'm a big finisher now. I think it's very, very important to finish. Anybody can start something. Yeah. That's really easy. The hardest part in life, and that's with anything. Oh, it's a marriage, a job, college, anything. You, you, there has to be a beginning and an end. And then you move on to the next chapter. You know, it's like chapters in a book. Yeah. So for me, you know, I just, I realize a lot of the things that were important to me were a giant waste of time. And I try not to beat myself up about it because yeah, I want to yeah, move be forward, as man. As full of life as I can now. But. Yeah. You know, not just ignoring family, you know, ignoring, you know, going to a birthday, a niece's birthday or, or, uh, you know, and because, oh, I've got this important thing I got to do or whatever, you know, like uh, it, it, it's stupid. I mean, you have to remember that the art is more important than the artist. The artist is a vessel and they're yeah. lucky to do it. And a lot of them have, some of them have talent, not a lot. Some of them have a lot of talent that go that last throughout a lifetime, but it's the art that you create yeah. that means 
and you leave behind. So you're, you're more, you're better balanced as you're getting older. I'm much more balanced. Yeah. That's great, man. I am easier to get along with, uh, uh, you know, if you hear laughing from my wife in the background, you know, <laughs> don't worry. Mine would be laughing <laughs> the same. Trust I, me. I, I am, as I get older, it, I, I try not to take myself so seriously, you know, and it's really hard to take the world seriously. Right. For all yeah, of yeah. us. For all of us. Yeah. Yeah. You just got to give 110% and then whatever the cards, yeah. you know, focus on the good and that's it. Man. Yeah. Die with your sword in your hand. There you go, man. Something about yourself people might be surprised to hear or might find a little odd. Um, a little odd. Uh, I think people find a lot of things about me odd. Uh, <laughs> I am a sensitive person. And, and I worry too much about that. You know, I worry too yeah. much about what I'm accomplishing rather than the importance of something that I'm accomplishing. Yeah. So um, you tend to take things too personally sometimes. I take things too personally. It's one of the things I work on a yeah. lot. Yeah. Um, Mark Ford's kid told me one time, his name's Elijah. And we were actually, I was on a tour with Mark. It was a, uh, um, on his solo record. And um, it was me and Mark. His kid, he, he asked, hey, do you mind if we give my kid a shot for the guitar? I'm like, sure, it's a great kid. And that was a bit of a rough tour. Mark and I were kind of at odds. I was tour manager, bass player, and the keyboard player. And it was a lot for me to take on. Um, but it was fun. I think we did that for about two years. But one time after Mark and I got in a fight, you know, and I stormed out of the, the sound check and whatever. And Elijah came out to me and he said, you know, it's really important for you to be right, huh? And I got really pissed off at him. Who's this cocky little shit, you know, telling me about what's important or whatever, right? And um, years later, I realized, you know, I'm so glad he said that to me because it is important to be right. It's very important for us to be right. It is not important for me to take the credit of being right. Uh, but it's important to get things right. That's why we're here, aren't we? Isn't yeah. that why we're doing everything we do? Building a house and making a song. And it's got to be the best that it could possibly be. I have no idea what your question was, but for some reason. That no, it was uh, something about you. People would be surprised to hear find a little odd. See, I, I, I've, I don't a hundred percent agree with that. I don't think when I stop. I think it's important to do things right, but yeah. in an, in like, I don't, I no longer think it's like when I have a conversation with somebody, it, oh, when I was much younger, it always was important for me, even with my wife, mm -hmm. I'm right here. And it was important that she saw my point. And I was actually at a, not an NA, like a Naranon meeting, I think. Mm -hmm. And a guy, you know, they read the passages and, and I didn't go to these meetings very long. And he opens up in today's passage, says, what's so important about being right? And when he said that, it was like the sky parted mm. and the sun came up for me because I, I felt, and I was at a point in time I, I was making changes in my life. I wanted to be less stress and be, have more happiness. Mm -hmm. And I felt a flood of like, I said, man, I'm so glad I heard this because I have spent a lot of energy being of importance of being right. And who gives a shit? Okay. So let me clarify what I mean. Yeah. Um, and I don't think you're talking about being right in that context. I'm I think you're talking, talking about, about the integrity. Yeah, yeah, I'm not talking about winning an argument and yeah. proving to everybody that you were right. Yeah. It was wrong. I used to do that when I was a younger, you know, even dumber man. Uh, <laughs> but it's important to get things right. Yeah, when you have to have integrity. It's important. It's not as important for a single person in society, but it's important for society. Yeah. You know, you can't start, that, that's the mess we're in right now. You can't believe anything. Yeah. Anybody said, there used to be a line that you didn't cross. You couldn't 
state something as fact if it wasn't. Right. You know, you could state it, you could dance around it, and you could state a, a strong opinion, but you couldn't forward that without being shamed. We're not talking about legality. Right. We're not talking about that. We're talking about morality, you know, not totally in a religious way. We're talking about integrity. Yeah, integrity. Is what I to that. It is important to have a life, to have a string of events in your life where, where you tried your best to get it right. Yep, I get you. I, I'm, I agree you know? with you on that. Yeah, that speaks to you. Yeah, I agree with you 100%. That's about your integrity and your intent on what you're doing things. Yeah, I agree with you on that. But yeah, totally, man. Who's had the biggest influence on you, Mark, both musically and then personally? My parents. Biggest oh, wow. For sure. hundred um, percent. Musically, I, I got to go. I got to go back to Anton. You know, it's not necessarily, it, it's not a, a direct uh, transference. Like, oh my God, I want to make music that sounds like that. You know, or that's the process now with how I want to make music. It's not about that. It was about the right time, right place. I learned so much about letting go. Yeah. And, and just letting the actual art. I think it was one of the first bands that I worked with that I truly had confidence in um, regarding their ability to do something interesting to do something beautiful and compelling artistically you know so it kind of it 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 helped me to relax a little bit like well wait a second i don't need to fix everything here yeah uh, you could just be the uh, yeah okay yeah and aunt anton was the guy that would on a daily basis remind me of that you know that i am not the king here he is the king and I'm working, I'm, I'm the hand of the king, you know, and he would, you know, the Anton, you know, that guitar is out of tune. Don't tell me it's out of tune. And, you know, it is what it is. And it's like, I'm, you know, look, it's out of tune. It's not about opinion. It's out of tune. Right. It's a but fact. Anton put the other three guitars on there, which were also out of tune. <laughs> okay. When you brought up all three faders, that was the Brian Jones Sound Massacre. And that's what made it great. Right. And I realized, you know, some of the greatest music is not in tune, you know? And I'm a very analytical person when I, when I produce. I want everything to be technically right. I don't want to drop any ball there. Right. But you can't let the music always be technically right. If there's a great artist in front of you, let them do what they do. And that's a producer whose name will be remembered. Right. He may not have, he may not have done a lot of physical work at the time, but he made the right decision to let it go you know, and to let it happen. That's cool that you got that out of that experience with him, man. Yeah. I mean, I still struggle with it. I still, I'm a control freak in some ways, you know, and, and, um, I struggle with it, but I always, it's nice. I don't know if I would have been a good producer back in the day where you just had 15 minutes of two inch tape and a few takes because times, you know, clocks running out on today's $2,000 a day studio. Yeah. Um, so those are the guys who are producers, those guys, you know, um, Kramer and, and, and George Martin and those guys that had to technically figure out, all right, we have a limited amount of tools here. How do we make this happen? How do we let this incredible music and sound, you know, find its way to vinyl? Uh any non-musical superpower? Oh, God. Um, I don't know. I, lo I love animals. That's cool, man. That's a superpower, but um, I'm a big fan of dogs, uh, horses, that kind of thing. So, I don't know. I think it's important for us to stay connected. Yeah, I think not, so, too. Not a toy. You know, not a... a, a, a and a purse for Paris Hilton. No. <laughs> Sorry, Paris. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's like people, we tend to use animals as tools. And, and uh, I hate that. Yeah, that's totally not cool, man. 
Yeah. Hey, two more questions, Mark. Toughest decision you ever had to make or most difficult thing you've had to do? Mm, well, since we're talking about music, um, quitting CRB, uh, quitting the Chris Robinson band, um, really tough. Uh, it was an incredible time in my life. Some of the greatest music I've made. Um, uh, it was just, you know, without getting into the details, um, it was just too much for me. There was a lot of touring. There was a lot of touring. Um, it was tough for me to do without, uh, you know, drinking and, you know, everything else. That's a uh, huge sacrifice. Good for you, man. It was a big one. It was a yeah. really, really big one. And it was a hard, it was just a hard thing to do to Chris. Like, not that I'm that important, but I felt like I was kind of letting him down. Well, yeah, you felt a sense of ob loyalty, obligation. Yeah, yeah, I did. I still do. I still wish him the best. Um, um, but it was just too much for me after a while. It was hard. He's an intense person. I mean, 24 seven, that guy, when you rolled out of your bunk in the morning, he was already up reading a book, listening to music. Okay. And when you got up to take a piss in the middle of the night, he was the last guy in the lounge going to bed, doing the same thing, reading a book, listening to music, talking to whoever is there. Right. you know he is he's got so much in common with anton he would probably hate me for saying that <laughs> he does. he's like the two of them are are cut from the same cloth probably opposite sides of a cloth yeah. you know but um you know. well i'm glad you did that man because you gotta and keep messing your body up and drinking you know that man and uh, that is a tough decision, though. Thank you for sharing that. And last question, what's been the biggest change in your personality over the last 10 years? And how much would you say is intentional and how much is just a natural part of aging? I try to show up when I say I'm going to show up now. Um, but you seem like you always would have done that. No, no. I always wanted to. Um, and I always thought that I was. You know, but there was a certain amount of like, oh, well, they can wait for me. You know, I'm, I'm important here. So I need to, you know, you know, they're just going to have to wait. And I would come up with excuses. You know, I'd love to be there, but this happened and I can't help it. And, you know, honestly, 90 plus percent of the time, I probably could have helped it. Mm. And um, I should have just been more considerate. So I think I'm a lot more considerate than I used to be. I hope I am. That's what I'm trying to it sounds like also you've really like you, your ego was running the show for a little while there. And it sounds like you've done a great job. Like I would never think you're a guy who had an ego, but from some of the things you said, it sounded like that, oh, that God. was maybe the case. Yeah, I never fit in. I never, I always thought that I was the, you know, I was observing everything around me that was great. And I wasn't really an important part of that. So my ego was there to tell me that I was, you know, like, Oh hey, man, that's pretty, Wow, that's pretty, that's really uh, huge. Yeah, yeah, it was, uh, that's still, you know, I'm, you know, it's easy to talk about this stuff. Yeah, but <laughs> man, we're all, a, we're all a work in process, you yeah, know, it's, everything it's evolves. Work in progress, that's for sure, yeah. Everybody's like that, man. It's not like, you know. But at you least gotta... it's progress now, you know what I yeah. mean? It was, it was just a work in something, you know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> a little bit of progress every once in a while. Yeah, it's not like you got an issue. If you have whatever your issues are, you know, you recognize them and then, oh, it's fixed. It's, it, you know, it's not like a, like a sore, a cut on your finger. You know, this is shit that you got to, you know, our, all of our demons, man, they're, they're, we're constantly, you know, get back inside. You know, it's, a, it's yeah. an ongoing battle, man. You can't, it's you gotta, an ongoing battle. And, you know, you see some of these artists out there, you can see they're struggling all the time. Well, in your position, yeah. you can really see them as a you know, And it's great for us because there has to be some kind of sacrifice and pain in great music. Yeah. There just has to be. There is in great comedy. Yeah. You, know, there's, it's, you have to be stretched to the edge of your ability, you know, as a human being, to say something or create something that's important. Yeah. And, and um, I think that's maybe why a lot of people who, are, who get older as artists, they just kind of people think they lose it or whatever, 
you know, and, and, and they, there's not, they're not doing something edgy anymore, but I've come to appreciate the people that, you know, don't pretend to be edgy. Anymore. Yeah. You know, I'm happier than I was, you know, I'm not going to write a bunch of music about burning down the world, you know? Yeah, man. I totally get that. Dude, uh, first of all, thank you for everything. You've been a real nice guy to talk to, really open. And thank you for be being so open and kind, man, and sharing all this stuff. I want to tell people where they can find you. It's Mark Dutton, Mark with a K. Uh, but if you are interested in, look, if you are a younger artist or if you're working with a younger artist who's looking for a producer and a management company that can help them develop and see their way through the music business, the good, the bad, and the ugly, and actually someone to evaluate you know, the reality of, of the potential and what you could do with it and maximize whatever talent you have. Um, Mark's a guy you probably want to talk with. And the best way to do that is to get a hold of him through his production company email, which is Mod Production and Management Company. And that email is Mod Prod, Mod, M A U D P R O D at gmail.com. And what you want to do is send them a video or a link to the video of the artist and what, you know, description, what that person's going on and, you know, what have, what are the things you're looking for? And then this way he has enough information to make a decision as to, you know, does it, does it make sense for you guys to connect and at least get back to you? And, uh, and then Audrey and I will argue about it for you for a few days. Yeah. And then Audrey and back to you. yeah. And then one of them, whoever wins the argument, or loses, we'll get back. <laughs> we'll get, she didn't tell you that she always wins the argument. We'll, we'll get back to you. Yeah. Hey, you know, you should tell her, Audrey, what's so important about being right? There Dude. you go. And then, uh, she'll throw me, then she'll throw it back in my face. And quote <laughs> me. Yeah. Did I get that right, man? Is there anything else I missed on that? I think it's, you know, she's pro she'll probably strangle me because I didn't really think ahead on that stuff. But, you know, but yeah, it's, I'm not hard to find. All right, so check him out. He's also on Facebook as uh, Muddy Stardust or Mark Dutton. Mark, any final words of wisdom? Oh, man, just do what makes you happy and, you know, show up on time. Do what makes you happy and show up on time. That's about as smart as you can get, man, to be honest with you. Hey, listen, thank you for everything. I really appreciate it. Thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for being so candid and open. I really, really enjoyed talking with you. Yeah, me too. Thank you. Everybody, thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed this interview, please share it on your social media channels. We appreciate your support and subscribe to the show. Uh, thanks again to Mark Muddy Dutton for uh, showing up on time and for doing the right thing and for being right. And uh, make sure you go to everyonelovesguitar.com. Sign up to get on our newsletter list so you and I can connect. And most important, remember that happiness is a choice, so choose wisely. Be nice, go play your guitar or your bass or your drums and have fun. Till next time, peace and love, everybody. I'm out.